Yes, so thank you very much for the organizers to bring together this wonderful group here and this very interesting topic. And I'm going to continue in the direction uh, of the first talk about these organic materials and concentrating on the copper phase organic materials. I will show you a little bit about the dynamics of these systems and concentrate on a mod insulator, which is an undermagnetic insulator switching over to superconductivity and then about the spin liquid compound. Most of the experiments have been done in Stuttgart uh, for a couple of years with a large number of students and postdocs. We have a good collaboration with the people in Zagreb, uh, in Moscow, get samples from all over the world and also theoretical support from various groups. Now, the systems have already been introduced. These are two-dimensional organic conductors consisting out of these organic molecules, which is put in layers. And in between, you have sheets of the anions. It's a charge transfer. And most of the action is going on in these organic donors separated by these inorganic acceptors. So it's really a model system of a two-dimensional electron gas. Usually, it's it comes as an A to B thermometry, except of this one compound we just heard about. So uh, from the uh, stoichiometry, you expect a three-quarter electron-filled system or one-quarter hole-filled system. However, many of these come as dimerized uh, compounds, where two of these molecules are close together with a rather strong coupling. And then you consider one of these dimers as the uh, primary unit. Uh, the, uh, accordingly, you basically have a half-filled system. And that's why the mod physics becomes uh, interesting, these compounds. The Coulomb repulsion is about uh, an electron volt. And that's comparable to the bandwidth. So correlations are important. And we also have heard about that these things like to arrange in a triangular lattice, which is close to frustration. And so in addition, you have uh, all sort of uh, interesting issues as far as frustration is concerned on the spin degrees of freedom. But we also have heard that you have similar interesting things on the charge degrees of freedom. Well, as I said, they are uh, separated by these anions. And there is a certain coupling between the molecules and the anions. And all sort of effects happening in the anions, let it be by uh, irradiation, but also uh, from the stoichiometry uh, and the crystal structure will have an effect on these organic layers. And uh, some disorder can then affect the organic layers. Now I will start with a typical uh, mod system. Uh, these are these copper uh, compounds uh, where you have an uh, let's say, a bad metallic behavior. And then for strong correlations, it becomes a mod insulator, eventually an antiferromagnetic insulating state. Then if you apply pressure, uh, you can go to a metallic state and eventually to superconductivity. And this can be done also by changing the anions slightly, by just going from the uh, chlorine to the bromine. And that's what we did. So we put in different. Uh, anions and then basically had uh, a large number of samples next to this mod insulator transition. Uh, so that is a sort of chemical pressure where we then could study the dynamics of these systems. So on the one side, if you have the insulating compound, the resistivity shoots up and it's really insulating, while on the other side, it becomes superconducting at about uh, 12 Kelvin. And then you can have all sort of uh, solid solutions in between. But as I said, I don't want to study only the resistivity. We look at the dynamics. So we did optical experiments on these compounds. And this is now the optical conductivity as a function of frequencies at low temperatures for a number of different compounds. So if you start with the mod insulator, then you have a gap. And only above around 500 wave numbers, the conductivity increases. Uh, and that's where. Uh, you have the Coulomb repulsion U in this energy range. And then if you start uh, decreasing correlations in the sense that you uh, change the U over T ratio by the different uh, anions, 
then you gradually close the mod gap, but not that it shifts to low frequency, but you basically fill it in. So you fill in uh, this additional absorption. Eventually, uh, Drude component comes in when you are on the metallic side, and we can study now uh, what happens at these itinerant carriers as soon uh, as, uh, uh, let's say, bandwidth is large enough that it becomes metallic. So we did look at the frequency dependence of the scattering rate and the frequency dependent on the mass. And as you see, uh, for the different compounds, as you approach the mod-insulated transition from the metallic side, you have a much stronger increase of scattering rate, and you also have a much stronger increase of mass due to the increasing correlations, and that is basically what is uh, predicted uh, by uh, brinkmann rice and by uh, Kadavaki woods And we compared our experimental uh, analysis with theoretical uh, calculations based on dynamical mean field theory. We expect exactly the same. So for increasing correlations, the slope basically increases. Uh, and if you get closer to the mod insulator transition, and on the same side, the effective mass uh, which is a description of these correlations, also increases. So there's a nice correspondence uh, between uh, the experimental data and the uh, calculations. Now, looking a little bit closer, so what is actually the frequency dependence? So we now plot the scattering rate after subscript, uh, taking off the residual scattering rate as a function of frequency squared and then we see a linear behavior, and so that is on the metallic side, and you get closer to the mod insulated transition, and closer to the mod, you see the slope increases, but it always follows an omega square behavior. So you really have an omega square behavior of the scattering rate over quite a large uh, frequency range, up to about 500 wave numbers. And now this, of course, you can compare with the resistivity, and the resistivity also shows uh, T-squared behavior uh, for a large temperature range up to about 30 Kelvin. And again, the slope increases as you get closer to the uh, mod insulator transition. So the scattering rate actually is T-squared dependent and it's omega-squared dependent, just as you expect for a Fermi liquid. And then, of course, you could compare these both exponents as uh, these uh, two prefactors. And uh, what we get is a ratio of about 56. And when you look at uh, what you expect from a simple Fermi liquid, it should be 2 by square, which is about 40. So it's a pretty good <laughs> agreement, uh, which really indicates that the system seems to be a Fermi liquid uh, above uh, on, on the right side of the phase diagram in the metallic state. And since we look at different compounds, we see that the prefactor becomes stronger as you approach the metal insulator transition, and it really goes hand in hand uh, for the conductivity, uh, temperature dependent uh, uh, resistivity, and uh, frequency dependent conductivity. So it is a, a Fermi liquid state where the superconductivity. Uh, then develops. So we really think that this regime here, you come down, it crosses over from a bad metal to a Fermi liquid, and then eventually becomes superconducting. While here you go to a mod insulator, and then at lower temperatures, uh, you have the antiferromagnetic ordering. So this was on these uh, copper compounds, a model compound of a uh, mod insulator transition. And so that was, uh, we saw a similar table before, where we have now a different U over T ratio. But what also can be changed, that you basically change the dimerization by going to a, a different compounds, where the, then the U gets much smaller. But of course, you could also change uh, the ratio of the coupling, get closer to the perfect triangular arrangement, and that eventually brings us to the spin-liquid compound, 
uh, this copper CN where you are uh, rather close to the perfect frustration and the U over T get even stronger. Now these two compounds are both insulators, mod insulators. One undergoes a magnetic order at around 40 Kelvin, that is this chlorine compound, while the uh, uh, and 25 Kelvin is the antiferromagnetic order, while the other compound, uh, as we just heard, shows no magnetic order down to about 30 millikelvin. Uh, but it has a very similar arrangement. The resistivity goes up and somehow in a different way. So that is uh, this one where it shows antiferromagnetic order, just rather a kink, while the spin liquid compound really has a continuous increase. There's not, no real kink to see in this arrangement. Now, if you look at the optical properties, I showed you before there is a mod gap seen in this uh, compound, this chlorine compound, while in the spin liquid compound there seems to be a continuous decrease of conductivity. There's no clear-cut uh, gap to be seen. And if you look at a function of temperature, in fact, we see when we cool down, the optical absorption becomes stronger uh, in this region where the gap is supposed to be. So there is an increase in optical conductivity as we cool down. Well, of course, there is a crossover because the resistivity uh, shoots up. I mean, it's an insulator all the time. So it is a perfect insulator, but in this regime, uh, it's just the opposite behavior. There's an additional absorption uh, as cooled down. Now, one idea suggested by Simone Frattini to me is that, well, we basically come down here close to this transition, eventually uh, re enter the metallic behavior. But in fact, that's not the case. I mean, we do stay insulating. So if you flip it around, and then we have seen this diagram just before, we are probably at the side where we are really on the insulating side. We are not close to the metal insulator transition. There's no re-entrance where we come back to the metallic side. So we're rather far away uh, from this uh, transition. So then the question comes, what, what are these absorptions? So now if we look at uh, a larger frequency range going down all the way to the uh, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz range, and then we decrease the temperature, then we see that, okay, the uh, conductivity drops down rather low, but there is a sort of absorption going all the way up here uh, in a log-log uh, plot. It's a straight line, so it's probably a sort of power law behavior which is seen and becomes more pronounced at low temperatures. So if you look first at the terahertz range, then we see that there is a power law behavior, where probably with two different exponents, a sort of crossover, where the crossover frequency is around uh, the temperature. So this is at 100 Kelvin, 50 Kelvin, 20 Kelvin. So you see that this crossover shifts to lower frequencies. The exponent is about uh, 0.5 and crossing over to 1. Uh, there was a suggestion that this could be due to uh, spin-on excitations, and Patrick Lee made some predictions about this power loss, uh, which should be a crossover from 2 to about 3.3. .3. So that's uh, certainly different than what we have uh, observed in our experiments here. So I'm, I'm not sure whether this is really due to the uh, spin-on excitations. Uh, if we look as a function as frequency, uh, we do see some sort of dielectric peak. I mean, the uh, epsilon uh, in this range in the perpendicular direction is about 10. That's not too big. But in the other two directions in plane, it's about a few hundred. Uh, so it's a rather strong dielectric response which shows up. And if you look at a function of temperature that was first done by Abdel Jawad, uh, he find that there is a strong increase of this dielectric response as you cool down. Uh, so kicking in at about 60 Kelvin and then uh, becomes rather big. And that is the epsilon perpendicular, as I mentioned, it's about 10. Uh, it's not enormous, but there certainly is something which becomes stronger as you cool down. And the, uh, 
Uh, in this frequency range, no. I mean, I would, so then you basically, you should look at the frequency dependence, and these are basically those data here. Uh, I mean, may, I mean, that seems to be a sort of, when you go down to extremely low temperatures, maybe it becomes lower and lower. But I mean, we are already at 10 to minus 6. At one point, the electrons don't move anymore, and then you don't see anything. So it becomes damn insulating. That, that is the problem why it's so tricky. Uh, so it looks like a relaxer ferroelectric, meaning disorder. But, but the question is, what sort of disorder do we have? I mean, what sort, what sort of dipoles do we actually probe? I mean, where does it come from? And, and the first idea that this really comes from the dimers, that these are dipoles within the charge transfer on the dimers, that cannot be. I mean, we're talking about kilohertz and megahertz range. I mean, that has to be something rather long last. So, yeah, so this, is this is perpendicular, but if you measure within the plane, it doesn't look much different. I mean, that I showed you here. Now, we did measurements in all, uh, all three directions. Uh, the numbers are bigger. The behavior as a function of temperature is rather similar. It's just a little bit more tricky to measure. So now the question, is it really what we see within the dimers? Is it within these BDT layers? And, 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 and we have the feeling maybe the anions are actually important. So let's have a look at these anions. Uh, and we discussed it already yesterday night. I mean, these anions consist of copper. They are linked to the neighboring copper by the cyanide, so CCN. And then if you do a structural analysis, so each of the copper has three links to neighboring coppers, and they are CN groups, and they are arranged like that. But this is basically the center of symmetry. And now the question is, is this CN or is this NC? So what, what sort of arrangement? Well, probably this is not really the center. Maybe you have to break the symmetry and, and make a decision. This has to be either CN or NC. But of course, these are very close. I mean, can we be both? And so from structural point of view, you have a sort of disorder because you have this isomorphism of the CN, which can be in, in both ways. And, and I mean, they're, they're equal. Otherwise, they're all linked by uh, central symmetric symmetry, but, but here you have a sort of ambiguity, uh, and this can really lead to disorder. It doesn't change the potential a lot, but it does change a little bit, and there is a dipole sitting on that. I mean, next, if you look at this copper, I mean, this copper, as I said, is linked to three neighboring coppers by the CN group, and then, of course, it could be a, a 1N and 2 carbon, or, one, uh, or 2 nitrogen and 1 carbon. So both are possible. So you have a sort of frustration. And I mean, that's close to 120 degrees, in fact, in this compound. So you have both. You have disorder in these anions, and you have a sort of frustration in the anions. And well, we are not interested in the anions. We are interested in the ET, but there is a sort of coupling. So if we, I mean, we, we, we came to that by, by looking at some uh, optical measurements in the terahertz range where we found some, some peaks around one terahertz. Uh, we, we didn't know what it is. There was an idea that these are collective excitations, uh, but, but that didn't seem right to us. And uh, so we actually did now up in each euphonium calculations uh, on this compound. And I'll, I'll give you an idea how the whole thing actually looks like. Uh, so this is now. Uh, a view on this compound, and you see that in this frequency range is around one terahertz, that these things are vibrating. It's really the anions uh, move with respect to the organic layer. They all move together, and this is mainly in the B direction, so mainly uh, in the C direction, and there is a similar vibration perpendicular to it. Now, if you go in the perpendicular direction, it's a little bit of different frequency. You also see that they move with respect uh, to these organic layers. So they all move, and you have to see it's a charge transfer compound. So the anions are uh, negatively charged, and the organic layers are positively charged. So of course there is something going on, and there's a dipole involved in it. And uh, so that seems to be actually the reason why uh, we have these modes here. 
And if you do the calculations, as uh, you see, it fits quite nicely. So around 220 uh, wave numbers as a mode. There should be another one at 38 and 41. So these are these three modes. And the other ones are these two modes. So the agreement is, is, is rather perfect. So actually, what we are looking at is a sort of motion of these anions. And if you look now at the electronic uh, properties, so the charge distribution within these anions, uh, there is a lot on the kappa here. But, but they're different. I mean, for the different uh, arrangements, the one with two carbon, and these are the one with two nitrogen, the electronic uh, this, uh, configuration, of course, is a little bit different uh, as expected. And if there is a sort of disorder, then this will certainly lead to a, a potential which is slightly disordered. But also the cyanide groups are different. I mean, the one which are here in the B direction, they make a chain that goes to the left and that goes to the right is a different sort of charge arrangement uh, compared to the one uh, in the C direction. So there is an anisotropy. And now if you look uh, perpendicular, meaning these are the anion layers and these are the organic molecules that you see, there is a strong link between the anions and the ethylene groups. And so there is a, uh, basically an effect on the uh, BDT layer. So all sort of disorder frustration on the anions will work back on the ET layers. And maybe that is actually the reason uh, why we do see uh, this sort of uh, behavior uh, in these compounds. So that is the conclusion we uh, came to in uh, our experiments. Uh, so this sort of spin I didn't even talk about the magnetic properties effect. So, so maybe they are not linked. I mean, who tells us that all these dielectric things are really, really linked to the spin properties? I mean, it's a spin liquid, we know. But here I only had charge degrees of freedom, and, and I, I didn't really need the spin degrees of freedom. So, so I, I don't know what the coupling is between both. Uh, but, but I do know there is a sort of frustration in these compounds. Uh, and in the anions, we do have uh, disorder and frustration, which works back to the organic layers. And uh, there is rather strong vibrations. Uh, and uh, it goes up all the way to the infrared and higher frequencies, of course. And since this is a salt, a charge transfer salt, there's always a dipole moment involved in that. Uh, and uh, that certainly. Uh, could be an explanation for the dielectric response seen. Of course, I don't understand why it becomes bigger as we cool down. So that is something we, we still have to understand. And, and I mean, you can fit it, and somehow it diverges close, where you have the anomaly at around 8 Kelvin. And so there are a couple of things we don't understand yet. Uh, but that is certainly uh, a different way uh, to look at these compounds and not just looking at the uh, magnetic frustration. Thank you very much.